Hello and welcome to another episode of Bare Bones Wargaming, a show with no bells, no whistles, no frills, just a man, a camera, and his game. On this episode, we are on the trail of the fox, the desert fox to be exact. Fox on the run. Oh, that's something else. <laughs> How those sweet is awesome. We are looking at Drive on Suez from World at War Magazine, issue number 78. So, the not the most recent issue. 79 is the most recent one, but fairly recent. And we're taking a look at this North African game, which basically covers the time period from after the fall of Tobruk until, of course, roughly... The Battle of El Alamein. Now it can go farther than that, depending on how you, as the Desert Fox proxy, substitute, uh, vicarious fox, uh, manage to handle things and fight. Now I will say, uh, before I get too far in this, I just want to say real quick, a little thing here. Um, years ago, when I was a kid, I kind of cut my teeth on Rommel and Patton. When I was in 5th, 6th, 7th grade and I was really starting to study World War II more in depth, uh, I started with those two gentlemen. Uh, and here shortly, I'm going to start actually reading this book, which I got, believe it or not, almost 30 years ago. I bought this at, y'all sitting down, Walden Books. <gasps> if you don't know what that is, Google it. Oh, I have a feeling most of my viewership, y'all know what I'm talking about. Anyway, Rommel has always fascinated me. North African campaign, not so much. Uh, so I've kind of let some of my North African campaign games go, like Shifting Sands and stuff over the years. But this one, a system similar to Crete 1941, Objective Havana, Patton's Third Army, if you've played that one. So it's a solo game. And it's very much puts you in the position of the Desert Fox. And I like that. It gives good feel, like most of these games do in that particular genre, if you will. Or that system, I guess, maybe is a better way of putting it, without getting things overly complicated. Right? Now, before I start this, I will say that if you pick this up and play it, just read the rules carefully. This is my third or fourth play already, and I think I have everything down pat. There's a couple of things I was missing, a couple of little subtle things that you have to kind of watch. But... Um, Overall, the, the rules, I think, are, are well handled, well written. Uh, I think the game is well presented, although if you look at this, I, <laughs> I am kind of amazed at, you know, just, I feel almost like the genie in Aladdin when you look at the size of the map, you know. Phenomenal, awesome game. Itty bitty playing space. But it does work, you know. Um, it is a fairly compact geographical area, as most of you probably know, thanks to the Qatar, I think is how you pronounce this, uh, depression down here. So, all right, onward and upward for the Desert Fox, which the first book I ever read about him was by Desmond Young, who I believe was a British general, and it was written fairly c closely after the war. Somehow, some way, I came into the possession of a large print edition of the book. Go figure. Funny thing is, now that I'm almost fully, that book actually would come in handy <laughs> for a large print edition. But I'm not sure where I put it. That's a good question. I have to find out. Yeah, it's here somewhere, I'm sure. All right. So, here we go. Now, as with most solo games, there's a very organized sequence of play. So you want to keep that in mind as you play. By the way, before we start, I just want to mention over here, if you've already noticed and been like, dude, what is with the white dice? Um, that is spaces that have airfields, like uh, down here at Jarub, Jar Jarub, Jarbub, down here. Um, it's important for a modifier in the game. And since the spaces, as you can see, kind of get covered up, I put the dice there to remind myself where the air bases are. Uh, not only for the modifier, but also for flying missions. More about that here in a little bit. All right, here we go. So first turn, first part of the turn, first thing you do usually is you draw a random event. Basically, they're calling them bulletins here. But for the opening turn, you do not do that for Panzer Army Africa. So now we're going to do the reinforcement phase. Now, the reinforcement phase consists of two parts, getting more supply and bringing in more troops and or support units. Okay, so I'm going to use um, some of my handy-dandy German, as you can see, there's the Balkan Cruise dice here. And let's see. Now, Rommel in the game 
let me go ahead and zoom in on this. Rommel can be basically put in one of several positions here if you look at this chart. He can be put in Berlin, which is where you can use him to get more support units. He can be put in Roma, which is where you can use his influence to get more supply. There is optional rules. There's about three or four pages of optional rules, which I printed out and have not tried yet. But you can put him here to influence Malta, Operation Hercules. And then, of course, you can put him, like, on the map with units to help influence combat. Okay? So I put him supply because, of course, supply, naturally, especially in the desert, is one of the big bugaboos of things. So we're going to get a plus one modifier. And also we factor in the air situation, which runs everywhere from allied air superiority to parity to axis superiority. More about that here in a minute. All right. So plus one to the die roll. Four plus one is five. All right. Not too shabby. Not too shabby indeed. So let's take a look and see on the chart here, the supply chart, what we get if we look over here. We have the supply, uh, here it is, supply reinforcement table. Air superiority right now is allied, that's a zero, so there's no modifier from that, but Rommel gives a plus one, making it a five, so we got four supply units. Now, supply units can be placed in any port, and of course, at the beginning of the game, the Axis only control Tobruk and uh, Bardia. So I've got four. I'm going to place one here in Bardia because you can stack up to three in a spot. And I already have three in Tobruk. But I could bring in three. You can overstack temporarily, but you must um, get them moved around uh, by the end of the turn. Okay. Sometimes with the sub reinforcements and such, um, you, can, you have to, well, actually, no, I misspoke. You have to keep them off the map until the next turn. So this one is fully loaded already, but at least I'll have these supplies coming in, and if I can manage to grab another port here quickly, I'll be able to get those guys to come in as well. Okay? Now, I could bring in reinforcements. Now, the way you bring in reinforcements is by the Desert Fox track up here at the top of the map. Now, this is similar to if you played Crete 1941, the Middle East Command, where there's the high, medium, low levels, which of course influence things. Same thing happens here. This is important to victory points because when the game ends, which either is on turn seven, if you don't get past the El Alamein uh, triangle here, if you will, it ends here, and then of course it ends on turn 10. If you do manage to get past this and capture all three of these spaces, this is very important because this is gonna tag on 10 victory points if you keep it high. So you want to do that, but in order to get reinforcements, you have to spend the Desert Fox points, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna spend some Desert Fox points and I'm just gonna bring in a couple of long range bombers, which only cost me two Desert Fox points and put them in the reinforcement space and then I'll knock it down there to 22, all right? So I'm still in good shape. I'm still on the high end of things. All right, which by the way too, with the rule book, I printed this page off their e-rules website because they kept flipping back and forth to this so much and you know with solitaire games you need to follow the the sequence of play very carefully so I just printed this separately it makes things easier I highly recommend doing it before your first play alrighty now there is an intelligence phase here but I don't have any intelligence units right now on the map for the Africa Corps so we're gonna skip that step alright now operations phase here we go first thing is the long-range bombers now long-range bombers can be used in one of two ways you can use them either to influence the air superiority chart or you can use them tactically in battle now the advantage of using them tactically in battle is tactical airplanes have to be within range of the battle itself. So you have to be within two spaces of an axis controlled airfield. But long range bombers, you basically just have to have the airfield and you can fly at any distance. But what I like to do is drag down this air superiority, kind of like again, Crete 1941, where you're trying to drag down the strength of the Royal Navy right off the bat. So I'm gonna go ahead and start there and I'm gonna go ahead and launch all these planes. You can launch as many long range bombers as you wish. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And I'll tell you what, let's slide down here. And we'll see how well they do. So I've got a boatload 
of Luftwaffe long range bombers, four, and I've got a single Italian one. Now, in this game, you have a battle results table. You have a CRT. Uh, other games like Crete, you don't. You're firing with the units and trying to hit equal to, less than, that kind of thing. It kind of works out to the same thing here, but it's a little bit different depending on the terrain situation. So I'm going to go ahead and roll my for my four German planes, and let's see what we get here. All right, and higher is better. Okay, so we rolled a six, four, and two, three. And I also have Italian bags. I got one Italian plane. Hey, hey, hey. They rolled a five. Now, a five on the battle on the battle results chart for air superiority will move it one to the left. A six will move it two. So out of this, we've rolled a total of a shift of three. So that one, two, three is going to drop it down to parity right off the bat. Boom! There we go. Now, if you roll a one, which we did not here, then you would end up having the planes damaged and you would have to spend supply to refit them and bring them in. Once a plane is used on a turn, then it is put in the use box until the next time around. So, a good opening fight there for our long range bombers. Everybody did their job. Excellent. All right. Next step. Ground movement. Now, ground movement, you move from space to space. Basically, every single space is a movement point, but some spaces you have to stop, okay, when you either enter them or cross them. Basically, the ones you have to worry about are allied fortified spaces, allied entrenchment spaces, and then also, let me zoom in here just to show you, also these escarpment, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, whoop, here we go, here's one here. Spaces, if you cross this, you not only have to stop, but it also gives the opponent a modifier. So you wanna be careful about crossing these buggers, okay? So, units can either move, mechanized units can either use move four movement points if you use a supply unit. And basically the supply unit has to start in the space with the ground unit. You expend it, it gives supply to all those units in the space. Or if you don't expend the supply unit, then you can move two spaces. Infantry, foot soldiers, are two spaces with a supply expended and one space without, okay? So, since we're pretty much close up against the barrier here, I'm not going to worry too much about the movement just yet, although, obviously, with North Africa, you do want to be hauling dupa as much as you can because, you know, I mean, you've got to go in a matter of just a few turns from here all the way to what I'm calling the LL main triangle down here here okay all right now when you move into a space what I like to do is mark it and I'm gonna go ahead and bring into this space move this now the uh, supply units can move two spaces by themselves like mechanized units or if you use a supply unit to support a supply unit they can move four okay and again be moving along there and such so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move these guys into this space I'm going to move this truck down one, two, so they'll be able to give combat supply. More about that in a minute. And I'm going to go ahead and move these Italians into here. I'm going to move these guys one, two down to here and grab, try to grab that airfield. And then, of course, I'm going to try to follow up with some of these other units here, including these supply units, which I'm going to go ahead and have them move just two spaces into here. To kind of clear things out for next turn. Now, once you've moved all your units, if you move into a space that was allied controlled, then you have the allied reaction phase. Basically, based on the terrain, you have a die range of anywhere from a one to a one through five that will bring in allied reinforcements. Okay, so we have three such spaces, and what I like to do sometimes when I'm playing the game, especially when you kind of get into a rhythm and, you know, with solitaire games, sometimes you get into moving and you're really just, you're rolling along and stuff and then you suddenly forget things. I like to kind of mark them with a yellow die just to remind myself after I move all my axis units, oh yeah, I need to do allied reaction, okay? Now, stacking limits are for the axis up to three division regiment sized units and then anything under that is kind of free stacking. 
for the Allies, it's four until Monty comes in, and then it goes all the way up to six for crying out loud. Okay? All right, so let's go ahead and see if we get any reaction here. Now, we'll start down here at the Oasis. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm trying. I don't think I can do it. Ah. My kid, my five-year-old, loves this song. Every time it comes on, 70s on 70s, he's like, Daddy, stop! Midnight at the Oasis! I'm sure most of you, some of you remember that and go, Oh my God, no. Please make it stop. Send your camel to bed. Okay, here we go. So we need a one. We rolled a five. So <clears throat> nothing happens. Now in these clear terrain spaces, you're going to need a one or a two. So let's see. We'll go just continue upward south towards the north. We'll go where the Italians are. And oh, ding, ding, ding. We're going to have some Brits there, as you can see, from, oh, let me slide over a little bit. Here, we got the Union Jack there. Dun, 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 dun. All right. And where the Germans, the Pensas, were rolling them, they rolled a three. So, no dice. All right. Now, if you roll a number that matches the Allied response number, in this case a one, that is the number of units you take from the regroup box and then you place into that space. So, as Gomer Powell used to say, surprise, surprise, surprise. So, there was somebody else there didn't have the best intelligence that we thought we had on that, okay? All right, so once we do the Allied reaction phase, then we're going to do combat, all right? Now, combat has quite a few steps to this. Again, some of this will be familiar to those of you who have played Crete 1941. You'll recognize some of these steps, but again, a few of them are a little different, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and start. I'm going to start with the upper one here, the German one, if you will. So what I like to do is I move the guys off the map, and I like to place this die because I just like using that die. When I, whenever I get the chance, I just I enjoy it. I ain't going to lie. So we'll start there at... What is that? Solemn, I believe, right? Yeah, Solemn, which is, as you can see there from the star, it's an objective hex, which, of course, gives you victory points at the end and also gives you Desert Fox points uh, to keep the table, as you use it for reinforcements, to kind of replenish it. You have to capture objectives and or defeat four allied units. By defeat, that means either knock them out of action or force them to retreat, okay? All right, now that we've got our battle site put together, let's go ahead and come over here. Not there. Here. Oh, we're going to need to come out a little bit so we can show you the battle. Okay, now, first things first. In a battle, as the Axis side, you've got to reveal, of course, the enemy. The Allies, okay, are set up there. they got two brigades, okay? For the allies, you organize them in terms of strength. So whoever's the strongest strength has to go first. For the axis, you can do it in any way you want. So I'm just going to leave them here as is. Okay? Now, once you've done that, then the next step you're going to do with combat, after you get everything set up and lined up, okay, you can get air and support units. Okay? Now, in order to get air units, you have to be within two spaces of an air field. Now, of course, we are within two spaces of an airfield in this particular case, so I'm going to bring in some Luftwaffe jockeys to go ahead and give us support. Now, speaking of support, support units in this game are basically like artillery units like this. Uh, sometimes they'll be flak units, and if you notice here, you can see the D on this counter. That means it can only be used in an allied counterattack. Okay? In order to get one of these support units, though, you must have a supply unit that you expend at the beginning of the battle. Now, supply units. The reason I brought this one along is if you do not use a supply unit, if you do not expend one in the battle space you're in, then every single one of your units reduces its strength by one, which is significant. Okay? The other thing is if you do not use a supply unit, you cannot bring in a support unit of any kind. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to expend this so that way my Germans, my 21st Panzer, 15th Panzer, are ready to strike. And just for the heck of it, I'm going to go ahead and bring in this stronger support unit here. So, once you've committed air and support units, and you can only commit 
one air and one support unit to a battle. Um, be careful with that. When I first did my clunker play, I was like, oh, great, I can bring in all this air power. This is cool. But it's like, ah, uh, no. Okay. Uh, so I kind of missed that the first time around. Uh, so, again, you know, there are some things here that you just kind of have to read it a little carefully and not get too carried away. I think as war gamers, the more games we play and the more that we, we get, the more we kind of sometimes rush through things and forget to read the fine print very carefully. All right, so now on the combat results tables, you have a couple of options here. Well, there's two options, really. When you're attacking or defending, it's either going to be a space that is an entrenchment or a fortress, or it's not, okay? What's the difference? Well, very simple. When it's not an entrenchment or a for fortress, a five and a six are the numbers you want. Six deals a hit to the enemy unit. Five forces them to pick up their pick up their stuff and head on out to the next space over, okay? To retreat from the axis or regroup. Now, the allies, if they have to retreat, they go back into the regroup pile, which is off the map. Again, kind of like Crete, where you have all those forces there. Okay, but air power and support units get to shoot first, and the combat factor is how many dice you roll. Okay, so I'm going to roll two for my loose waffle boys. Ah, three and a two. What the what do you want? What? We missed. All right, fine. So now they go in the used box. They can't be used again until next turn. All right, let's see if this artillery will help me out here. They get two. Four and a three. Come on, guys. All right, so none of that helps. Now, when you use a support unit, you put it back into a cup and draw it randomly. So whenever you get support units as reinforcements, if you want to, at the beginning of a turn, you have to draw it blindly from the cup. So you never know what you're going to get. Okay. All right, once you've done those preliminaries, then you have to figure out who's going to get the tactical edge. So what I'll do is I'll roll the two dice and we'll go over the modifiers. All right, well, this is definitely looking good for the Africa Corps, okay? So it's pretty straightforward as far as the modifiers go. Okay, for the Germans, if you commit Rommel to the battle, which I didn't, he's not here. Remember, he's in Rome helping me with my supplies. So I wouldn't get any modifier from that. Pencers, oh yeah, baby, 15th and 21st Pensa are there. So that's plus one, that would make it seven. And the Desert Fox Index is high, that would make it eight. And then, of course, there's also the Intelligence. So I've got eight, okay? Now, for the allies, okay, any armor? <clears throat> no armor, okay? Battle space has a plus one indicator for the allies on the terrain effects chart. Uh, let's see, this is clear terrain. So, <clears throat> no, basically you're looking for fortresses and entrenchments again. You know, when you're out in the wide open in the desert or escarpments, you're not really gonna, um, yeah, you're not really gonna be getting any help there, okay? Desert Fox Index is low. Well, we know it's high. And that's it. So basically, we have a case of 8 to 2. So clearly, the Germans, the Germans, have the initiative. All right. Now, here's where the combat system gets a little bit different from what you've seen with, like, Crete. Okay? So you're going to fire these guys off in lines. And hits have to be applied to the first unit in the line. Okay? Sequentially. So what I do is I slide these guys down like this a little bit. And remember, I use full supply, so these guys get to roll four dice. Okay, let's see what we got here. All right, well, good news, bad news. Bad news is 75% of our shots missed. The good news is we got a Balkan cruise, which is a six, which is a hit. So this allied unit will then be put into the temporary eliminated box. And then, of course, I'll show you here later how they can come back into the battle, potentially. All right. Now, after the side with the advantage shoots, then the other side gets to fire back. Now, in this case, only these guys get to shoot. They only have one factor. And the allies never have to worry about supply or anything like that, which should not strike anybody as odd, given, you know, what was going on um, in North Africa and kind of in general uh, with World War II. All right. Oh, the Brits. blowing me. All right, they rolled a five. Now, a five causes a retreat in this particular situation. So, the first unit in line is the one that takes the retreat result. So, the 21st Pensa is going to be kicked back one space. So, we'll remove them and kick them back where all those supply units were at Fort Capuzzo. Okay? 
All right, now, unfortunately for the British, that was their only unit, which means those guys are going to be sitting ducks here for the 90th mech and, but if you say that fast, that comes, never mind, and the 15th panzer. So we got three dice here with the 90th. We got two misses. And the last one, okay, the last one is a five. Now, for the allies, the five is not a retreat. They go off the map into the regroup pile to be mixed in with the other units there for next time, okay? So the battle is over. The Axis have won, okay? All right, and if you're wondering about the little number here at the bottom, uh, that's the step number and the little S uh, the start. By the other th way, the other thing I want to mention about the counters is um, I forget who they used started using as their printer, but I am so impressed with how Decision Game has stepped up their counters. All right, so let's head back to the map. Let's get this five out here. All right, so back up to the map we go. We got this battle going on here. All right, so we have won the battle. Woohoo! Now, we have captured Solom, which is an airfield. So I like to, and like I said, I like to mark it just as an easy, quick visual um, to deal with things and be able to count and see where my air bases are. And then, of course, Solom now on the Desert Fox table is worth one point. So now we're going to move up from 22 to 23. All right, so that battle is now complete. So now let's move south to... Hafaya, and we'll go ahead and see how that battle plays out here. So let's mark it with my little nuclear war die. That's where I got that die from. From I forget which. I don't think it was the original nuclear war. It was Escalation or... Isn't there another expansion for that? Escalation and... I don't know. But there is another one. I just can't think of the top of my head. All right. So again, let's come down here. All right. So, first thing we do, let's see who's home. Ooh, that's a little strong. That could be a little problem for our Italian friends. All right. Now, support units. Let's see, do I have an air base, controlled air base within two spaces? Yes, I do. So, I'm going to go ahead and bring in an Italian air unit to give support there. Okay. I did not, did not use a supply unit, so of course these Italians will actually be fighting at one point weaker. So I'm going to go ahead and put these guys this way. Remember, you could arrange this any way you want. So if you want it like this, or if you did want to put those guys first, you could have, just in case they take the first blow. Um, but remember, the Allies always have to be strongest to weakest, left to right. Okay, I can't use a support unit because I didn't use a supply point. So let's see if this air unit can do a good job. Two fours. Oh, no good. But at least I didn't get damaged either. So we'll be ready for next turn. All right. Now, let's see what happens with the tactical edge here. Who's going to get it? Uh, more than likely here, when we add up the modifiers, as you can see, it's probably going to be the Brits because they're going to get the armor modifier. That'll take them up to six. The Italian's only real modifier is the Desert Fox track. That's it. Um, so, because it because it, it specifically says German Panzers, not just armored units. Okay. So the British have the upper hand. Yikes. All right. So once again, I just like to drop the guys down. And here comes the British armored unit. Whoops! I dropped them too far down, didn't I? Let's slide everybody up. There. We go. All right. Here we go. Uh, Aichi Wawa. I should have left that two unit up there. Okay. So. This Italian unit takes a step loss, okay? Now, there are a number of units, particularly armored units, that have substitute counters in the game. And, of course, that's what I've just done here is replaced it with that, okay? Now, you always will be able to fire at least. You have at least one firing point, even if, you know, your supply situation is a mess. Which, of course, it is because I didn't spend a supply point. But, since I had these guys first in line, they have to shoot next. There's no option on this. What the heck just happened? Why did they get all blurry on me? I don't know. That was weird. Huh. Okay. Oh, they missed. It was a three. Okay. So now we'll have the next British unit firing off here. Oh, 
two twos. Okay, that's good. All right, now, unfortunately, remember, this one only gets to roll one die two because I didn't spend a supply on it. Oh, hey, hot dog, it's a six. So these guys will get put in the temporarily destroyed box. And then I've got this last unit here. I get two shots with it. Come on, baby. And, well, I rolled this, which, depending on which set of dice, I have a set of dice for all the major powers. Um, I have ones for the U.S., U.K., Soviet Union, Japan, Italy, and uh, Germany. That one, unfortunately, is a one. But we did get a five, which will force these guys to retreat, so they will regroup. Okay? So actually, despite taking losses, we were able to win the battle. All right, very cool. Now, we will get the Desert Fox Index moved up by one. Because, of course, we won the battle capturing an objective space. Now, notice in both battles, we knocked out two units. Which, of course, means we won't move up the Desert Fox Index by another one. Because you must either force to retreat or, well, regroup, or eliminate four units. Now, same thing happens to the Africa Corps. If you lose four then you're going to lose Desert Fox points, okay? All right, so not too bad of a start there, all right? So we're all done with that. Now, on to the next step, the logistics phase. Now, the logistics phase, you can do one of two things here. With your supply units, you can either flip them over to depot status or you can keep them mobile as trucks. Now, the advantage of having them in a depot is they supply not only the units in the space, but also every unit adjacent to them for one subphase. Now, that subphase thing is important because movement is a phase. So if you expend the depot, it will let you move a bunch of guys, but you won't have any supplies for combat, unless, of course, you have a truck that is following along in the same space, moving with the units that you just gave supply to, okay? Mobile, you can only give support and supply to the unit, the units that are in your space, and that's it, okay? So, you can make that choice here. Honestly, most of the time, racing across, you know, this part of Egypt, I basically keep everything mobile until I get to the El Alamein Triangle, and then um, and that's when you kind of want to build your depots, in my opinion. I mean, you know, you can try your own strategies and such, but that's what I usually do with that, okay? All right, now, I can also expend supply to refit reduced units, including air units, okay? But they have to be in the same space. Now, here I do have the 21st Panzer in a space with the supply unit, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead, spend one supply unit, and bring 21st Panzer completely up to snuff. So now they have a strength of five. We're ready to roll, okay? All right, and that's your logistics phase. And that's it for the Panzer Army Africa portion of our festivities. On now to the British. Now, the British turn begins with the random events. Bulletins as they're called in this game. So let's see what the bulletin is. The bulletin is Alexander. Okay? And they did a nice job on the back of the rule book listing all the bulletins very nicely so you can quickly get there. Now the bulletins basically come in two types. They come in, play them, return them to the cup, or play them and discard completely from the game. So Alexander will follow his instructions here. You pick and deploy a Commonwealth unit from the regroup display to put one in Alexandria and one in Cairo. Now you have to do it within stacking limits, which is not a problem, of course, this early in the game. So one in Alexandria and one in Cairo. All right. And we shift the air power index one towards the Allies. What the what he what what? So now they have air superiority again. And Alexander, we're gonna say bye bye to him. Na 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 na. Because of course he is a discard bulletin. All right. So there we go. We got the discard bulletin. Now here comes a very vicious part of the Allied turn: the air subphase. Now every single turn, the Allies will launch airstrikes against three major targets your air units, your supply units, and your combat units. Now, the air superiority track determines modifiers that are done to it, okay? That table is up here on the map, and looking at modifiers here right now, allies have air superiority, 
So we have a zero for that. But again, why I put the white dice out, if the axis control four more air bases, one, two, three, and four, we do, then there is a plus one. Okay? Higher the number, the better here for the axis. So what we're going to do is we're going to roll the three dice, and then we'll implement the effects. All right, so this is going to be bad. The Union Jack is showing. That's a one. Oh, you got to be kidding me. Two Union Jacks. I was wondering if we are going to go for the trifecta, but we did not, okay? All right, now we just go, and I just like to roll all three, and then run down through the chart, and do each thing in turn, okay? So we will get plus one, but one plus one is two, which is good in this particular case, because, I'll tell you what, let me zoom in on the air attack table so you can get a good idea of what we're doing here, if I can get in on it. There it is. Sorry, moving around a lot, but there's a lot of things here to consider. So, this actually plus one modifier will help because the air unit's in A1. So one of my air units that's ready has to go to the refit box. So I'll take one of the Luftwaffe ones and we'll refit it. The next Union Jack, one plus one is two, is going to hit two of my supply units, okay? Now it's not bad enough that they're gonna hit my supply units, but here's where this really gets UGLY and alibi. Because when you implement this result on the map, you do it from east to west and north to south, whatever's closest to the front line, which is logical, okay? So I'm going to lose two supply units, and guess what? They're both going to be right here, which means I don't have a single supply unit on the map at this point in time. <sighs> yeah, I'm sure Rommel was kind of like, what the what he what what to? All right, and last but not least is combat units. So three plus one is four. In this particular case, nothing happens. Now again, if this hit number had been low enough to say cause a step loss, you would do the same thing. Whoever is furthest east and then furthest north. So in this case, it would have been one of these two German units up here on the coast. These guys way down here at the oasis. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm not gonna sing again, I promise. Um, they would only lose steps if all these other guys basically got slaughtered. Which by the way, if you do have a unit completely eliminated from play as the axis, you can bring it back in at its lowest step and then rebuild it from there. Okay? So if you lose one of your units, it's not completely out of the game. All right. So that's the air sub phase. Now, out and counterattack phase. So basically, this only happens if there are units in the same space. Again, this is just like the Crete game. In this particular case, there's nothing. But remember, we had this battle here with our Italian friends that was pretty close and if there has to have been that British unit there then we would do the whole battle procedure all over again. The Axis can use air units okay, if they're based within two and if they had a supply unit still in there they could then expend it to use support units as well. Okay, And they would have to expend a supply unit otherwise suffer that minus one combat factor in battle. So again, supply, supply, supply is critical here. Uh, I like how that's handled in the game. I think they do a nice job of really making it, you know, front and center like it was without being tedious about it or being something that, you know, you forget. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, I think, personally, I think it's very well done. All right, so we don't have to worry about the Allied counterattack phase, although um, there are bulletins that can lead to a a blah, 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 allied counterattack phases here. There's an A, B, and eventually a C. Um, but that one doesn't come in until if you manage to get the allied main triangle under control. Just so you know, on turn eight, this is what is coming your way. Look at all these Commonwealth units. And there actually is an optional rule, too, to bring in the U.S. 2nd Armor Division. Hell on wheels. I'm pretty sure it's the U.S. 2nd Armor. Hold on, let me look here for a second. No, no, no. Yep. Hell on wheels, baby. All right. As opposed to the first division old Ironsides. All right. Anyway, digressing there. So no counterattacks. So now allied replacement phase. So now what do we do there? Well, we take all the allied units in the box, and we're going to roll a die for each one to see what happens with them. They can either be brought back into the game, sent back to the replacement box, basically like they're still trying to reorganize, or, of course, be permanently eliminated from the game. Now... 
air power has a big impact on this, okay? A little bit ago, if it hadn't been for old Alexander's bulletin, okay, then we would have been at parity, which would only have been a plus one modifier. And again, this is a case of higher number better. But since the allies have superiority, it's a plus two modifier. So there's a greater chance of these units coming back. So let's start with this 33rd Armored Brigade. And they rolled a one. One through four is bye bye Thanks for playing. What part didn't you understand? The buh or the bye? All right. And then we have the 5th Indian Brigade. And they had a two. Which two plus two is four. Still not enough. Bye bye All right. So that's the ally replacement phase. Okay, end of the turn, administration phase. This is pretty simple. All you're gonna do here really is take all your air units that you used last turn and slide them back over where they belong. And by the way, you can never use tactical units to you know, do the air superiority chart. It always has to be long range bombers for that. Um, and the long range bombers, the only way you can tell them apart is really from the picture. Um, they're not really listed. I didn't see it anyway. In the rules. Okay, now if this was turn seven, which you can see over here, there's a little bit of writing on the space, then you would have to check and see is does the game keep going or is it over? And you check for victory points. And again, in order for the game to keep going, you have to grab and take a hold of all three of what again I have been referring to consistently and constantly because I like to refer to them this way as the Al Alamein Triangle. So, you have to have all three of them to keep the game rolling along there. Okay? So, that's it. That's a complete turn. Now we're ready to move on to turn two and the Axis Bulletin. Okay? Again, this game is very similar in structure to Crete 1941, which as you guys all know I love. Uh, it's very similar also to Objective Havana and Patton's Third Army. But again, I like how it handles the issues, the situations, the challenges of the campaign without getting tedious, bogged down, etc., etc. Or as I once heard somebody describe about Napoleon Bonaparte, part of his genius was he was able to master detail without wallowing in it. And I feel this does it. Now, of course, for those of you that are in heavily into the North African campaign, you'll notice, of course, right away uh, with the map, that the map begins over here at Tobruk. So, yeah, you're not going to be able to play the entire North African campaign. There's no Tunisia, okay? Although, obviously, if you get over here across the Nile, you can really raise some... Well, you know. Anyway... So, there you go. That's a complete turn. And of course, now what I would do is pull the Axis Bulletin and then just start everything all over again. Okay. Uh, again, it's a game that plays very quickly once you get the hang of it. Uh, I've been having a lot of fun with it. Uh, after this play, I'm probably going to shift onto one of my favorite games, which I think I'm pretty sure is going to be my 25th play of RAF, which you guys, of course, saw recently. I got the upgrade kit on... Uh, so we'll break out that new mounted map board and we'll kind of run things from there with that. Okay? All right, now, next episode. I'm not sure when the next episode will be. Part of that's probably going to be dependent on what games are coming, Kickstarter, those kind of things. Uh, I picked up some games recently, but this is kind of running out of things. Now, the soldiers and postmen's uniforms, I'll probably get to that before too long. I don't know exactly when, to be honest. Because, again, I, I, I kind of reach points where I'm into topics. I run with it basically till I exhaust myself, and then I move on to a different topic. Or sometimes it is driven by games. Like this one in front of you here, this Drive on Suez. I debated this for a while before I picked it up. And finally decided to, partly because of the strength of similarities to Crete. And I'm glad I did. Uh, this really probably will become my go-to game on the North African campaign. Because, I mean, this is the critical part of the campaign. After the fall of Tobruk, all the way down to the Battle of El Alamein in October of 42, if I remember correctly off the top of my head, 
because uh, again, it's, I'll be honest, it's been a little while since I read a book on the North African campaign. Um, so, my expertise do not lie there. That is for sure. Although I maybe should finally pull off my shelf once I get the Rommel biography read. That, um, what's the name of that book? Oh, crikey, I don't see it on my... Oh, there it is. This one here. Not I've seen this get mixed reviews, but um, I think part of the mixed reviews is because the author is kind of pushing pretty hard to basically prove that, hey, you know what, if the Germans had spent more time on the Mediterranean, they'd have won the frickin' war. This one here, um, the Mediterranean Theater in World War II, Path to Victory, which I guess kind of says it all when you think about it with the title. But I picked this up at a used bookstore, um, a great used bookstore that's no longer, um, well, here it is. Oh, I didn't even know this bookmark was in here, but um, there used to be this bookstore in Charlottesville, Virginia. I would go at least once a year to read it again. Whoops. Read it again, Sam. Um, which, by the way, Play It Again, Sam, is never actually said in Casablanca. A lot of other things are said, but never Play It Again, Sam. Kind of like, you know, Hello, Clarice, in Silence of the Lambs. He never actually says that. He says good evening and some other greetings, but never hello. Anyway, my point being it's too bad because the owner died unexpectedly, and then things got ugly. Um, I won't get into the details, but if you look it up on Reddit, you'll, you'll find the whole story laid out, and it's kind of a sad story. Uh, for me, it's always a sad tale whenever a used bookstore goes down. But anyway, so I might consider reading that book also, too. I'm kind of glad that I found one of these bookmarks, because I don't think I have too many of these bookmarks left. Hmm. It was such a great store, too. Not just for history, but for chess, too. He had a wonderful, wonderful collection and assortment of chess books. I picked up a number of books over the years once I first moved here. I picked up a huge um, stash of Napoleonic books. Uh, on the 200th anniversary of Waterloo back in 2015. So, Anyway, so I'm not sure exactly when my next video will be. I know we had a lot here, but it might be a little bit of a lull. But I will say, the next video, there might be a big surprise. So take a good look at this table. Hint, hint, because it might be the last time you see it. <gasps> so, anyway. <laughs> All right. So there you have it. Drive on Suez from World of War Magazine, number 78. And as always, this is Tim Korchnoy from Bare Bones Wargaming saying thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time from, I don't know. I will say without a doubt, when Absolute War shows up, I intend to tear into that bugger and get it on the table, show it to you guys as fast as I can because it looks really cool. I'm very curious to see how it plays. Uh, again, it's an area movement game, and I've kind of become partial to those, so we'll see how that plays out. All right, until next time, as always, thank you for watching, and hopefully I'll see you again.